thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Naveen El Nimri, and we're going to be speaking about PhDs in myopia research and TopCon's Maya on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. As I mentioned, we're joined by Naveen El Nimri, and uh, she is an optometrist who is now working in industry. Naveen, it's a pleasure to have you on the Myopia Podcast. How's your day? Thank you. It's great. Thank you. And it got better by meeting with you. <laughs> awesome. Well, likewise for me. Uh, Naveen, you you have uh, an OD degree, a PhD. You've got quite the background in the uh, arena of eye care and now working in industry. Can you give us a little bit of a uh, history of how you decided to go into eye care and what led you to do the PhD route and then now uh, going to TopCon? Yeah, so I was an optometry student in my country of origin, Jordan. and because I fell in love with that field, I really wanted to continue that route even after immigration. So as soon as I moved to the U.S. back in 2003, I decided that I want to do optometry, which is kind of different than in, uh, in Jordan. In Jordan, you, you start as an undergraduate uh, and it's not, a medic, it's not a doctor degree. It's just like an undergraduate degree. Over here, I had to do my undergraduate degree, which I've done it uh, in biochemistry at UC Berkeley. And then I, uh, after that, I moved into optometry school, which took a long time. And during that time, I was actually involved in the vision world by doing research also at UC Berkeley in the optometry school. Yeah. Um, and um, I got accepted to Ohio State University, where I did... Uh, my optometry school there, as well as a master's uh, in also uh, in myopia, clinical research in myopia. And uh, my mentor was Dr. Waleen. Um, during the first day of optometry school, I told myself that I really want to do a PhD and it's going to be in myopia and at the same lab that I worked as as a uh, an undergraduate like a, as a volunteer uh, at uh, the Wilson lab so and that's exactly what happened right after I finished my optometry school I moved back to UC Berkeley and I did my PhD uh, the focus was association between myopia and glaucoma mainly looking at the effect of lowering intraocular pressure on slowing down myopia progression in the guinea pig model after that, I ended up wanting to do more of clinical research. So I moved to UC San Diego, where uh, I focused more on glaucoma. I was hoping to do more of that between the association between myopia and glaucoma in humans, in human subjects. Uh, but um, some devices that I was going to use did not work as properly and COVID hit. So I uh, focused my research more on imaging specifically uh, OCTA, uh, OCT and geography uh, in glaucoma patients. But I was involved in some myopia studies as well and uh, association between myopia and glaucoma. After that, I, uh, there were some issues with the funding. So I decided that, you know, why not to switch my path and move into industry? Because industry, you don't have that challenge. And I always like to work on myself, you know, to grow on a regular basis, not only on the personal level, but on the professional level. And I felt like the environment in um, industry uh, is faster, like it's faster pace. There is more room for growth compared to academia. And here I am at TopCon Healthcare, been uh, with TopCon for the last year and a half as a medical science liaison uh, for vision uh, care and uh, correction. So I am mainly responsible for myopia management, dry eye, refraction, and anything that's related to, to that. Wow, what a path, huh? <laughs> it is a long path. Yeah. So I do have experience in clinic, academia, and industry. So it's like yeah. a hope. <laughs> yeah. 
Let's um let's go back just a little bit back into this masters and your work at Ohio State. What uh, what were th- some of the things that you learned about myopia that maybe you don't know if everybody else knows, right? So there's there's a lot we've learned since you know 2003 when you came to the United States in the myopia world, and then you started your process of undergrad and grad. Like, what are some things in that research that um, you know, kind of was an aha for you. Hmm. There were a lot of aha moments, you know, sure. in, you know my, myopia. Uh, the research that I worked on was focused on uh, soft bifocal contact lenses, and it was mainly on decentration of the contact lenses. So to me, like, you know, uh, it's not only about fitting a contact lens for myopia management, it's it's more of an art, you need to make sure that, you know, it's it's fitting correctly. And it is, uh, so you, you are looking through the correct zone in order to get the myopia management. So it's like, I discovered at that time that it's not like as simple as just like fitting a contact lens on the eye. You you need to treat each patient separately based on their condition, on their age, on uh, so many different uh, factors. Uh, So that's what I've mainly learned from my research that I actually used for my clinical practice. You know, we want to take myopia management to the masses and do it in every single myopic child. And when, when you say things like that, it's kind of along the lines of, oh, well, we'll just come out with a bunch of different products and then people just need to choose which of those it is. But kind of to the point that you mentioned is that myopia management isn't like dentistry. Myopia management is more like getting braces where every single mouth is different and every single solution that you come up with is different and it's individualized. And um, so I think that, 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 that is a really key takeaway. And that's part of the reason why we would, we struggle to be able to say, Oh, we're going to get it to a, a substantially reduced cost comparatively to where it is now, which I think we will, but you know, to, to, to bring that cost all the way down to just have it be like, here's a pair of glasses. I think we're a long ways away from that because of things that you learned, right? I do agree with you. Yeah, it will definitely take a long time. That's the thing that we need to increase more awareness for myopia management. You know, it's not only that we need to teach doctors, but we also need to teach patients and their parents about myopia management and all of these methods that we have available. Um, And I feel like this is still lacking. Actually, I was uh, listening to a lecture at GSLS and they were like saying, they're still at the point where, you know, a biometer that measures axial length, which is a very important factor, uh, like a very important piece of the puzzle in the myopia management, and a lot of doctors don't even have that yet. And it will probably take at least five more years to get a uh, biometer in every single clinic. So we do have a long way to go. That's for Yeah, sure. that would be a dream if it was in five years. I, I would love it to be faster than that. Okay, well, let's talk about glaucoma in myopia, since that was a major aspect of your PhD. I know you probably know way more about glaucoma in uh, guinea pigs, did you say, than, uh, <laughs> than many other people with myopia? But, um, you know, I, what I know about glaucoma is I'm a, I'm a minus 150. And so my risk of glaucoma, according to the studies, is like one and a half percent to two, uh, two times greater yes. than if it didn't, right? Mm-hmm. And then it goes way up the, 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 the higher my myopia is. And uh, this kind of all goes into is, is it a refractive problem or is it an axial length problem or is it something different? Uh, I believe that, you know, uh, since axial, since uh, myopia is related to axial elongation, it's directly related to the stretching of the sclera. And that's where the increase, increased risk of all of the other diseases comes from, not only limited to glaucoma, but also, of course, retinal detachments, cataract, maculopathy, all of it really related to the actual stretching of the sclera due to the elongation of the axial length. So... Uh, I think it's more of an axial length problem 
than a refractive error problem. And that's why it's very important to have a biometer in every single clinic and track yeah. that, especially in patients who are wearing orthokeratology lenses where you cannot track their refraction in that case. Very true. Very true. Uh, so if, uh, if, if you could go back, this is, this is going to be a fun, somewhat of a, a weird question. If you could go back and call this disease of eye elongation something, we call it myopia, which is confused for this refractive condition where your prescription goes up. What, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what would you summarize? We could call this disease, right? And, and, and this is a new wave that we're trying to come up with is look, how can we, how can we communicate myopia different than the refractive error that it is with a quick, easy terminology? You got any thoughts on that? Um, it's, uh, it's the disease of now, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, not only, I mean, it's, it's a full package. It's a multifactorial disease, you know, and yeah. uh, it's not only looking at one piece of a puzzle. So for example, in our device, now we're including a, a cert, like a, a questionnaire that includes like questions about talking about uh, myopic parents, the number of, the, of time, like the number of hours that you spend outdoors, the number of times that you spend doing near work activity. So it's really a multifactorial disease. That's what I would call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we need to call it the elongation disease or the, uh, the, the stretching, the eye stretching disease or something. We'll come up with something but, clever. Yeah, with more focus on, on axial elongation. I agree with you. I need yeah. to think about it though. <laughs> yeah. Come up with yeah. a creative name. Well, you're in the medical uh, the medical science department. Why don't you get the marketing people on that, and we'll see if we can come up with it. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, with with my, our company, we have very creative team who come up with really creative names for devices. So I would yeah. be surprised if they have an impressive idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, you and I first met because of um, because of the innovations that you guys have made at TopCon with regards to bringing myopia management uh, uh, measuring a little bit easier. One of the one of the devices that you have, and I'll have you speak more about it, is the Maya. Um, I've been consulting with different people and one of them, you know, we, we really recommended get the Maya because she wanted to do Earth okay. She wanted to do myopia management. She didn't have anything in her office. And what a what an incredible synergy to be able to bring that in along with the dry eye things that you've had. So um, what, uh, what kind of drove TopCon in this direction of saying, how can we provide resources for people who are doing these various different treatments um, to get into it? Because forgive me if, 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 I, if I put this the wrong way, historically, I have thought of TopCon as being the person who's put you know, exam chairs into my office and a slit lamp into my office and maybe an auto refractor. But this is like an, a new world of TopCon. Right. Yeah. Uh, TopCon is definitely is expanding faster. We have a lot of priorities and myopia management is definitely one of those just because uh, the prevalence of myopia is increasing. So it's becoming a major problem, especially in Asian countries. And that like kind of triggered uh, something for the company trying to, uh, you know, be part of the myopia management world and try to, to help people and help uh, slowing down myopia progression. So as I've mentioned, you know, given that myopia is a multifactorial disease, it definitely needed a multifunctional device. And TopCon is definitely known for having these multifunctional devices smaller devices that have like a bunch of tools and features that could uh, help, you know, uh, meet the goals of any clinician and researcher. Yeah. So, um, so tell us a little bit, you said that you work in the, in the myopia space, the dry eye space and so forth. Why don't you share a little bit about the Maya device and, and its evolution? Cause it seems like you guys keep adding to the device. I mean, pretty soon we're going to, it's, it's going to do everything OCT and, and everything, but tell <laughs> us where the Maya is right now. 
So uh, there are different versions of the Maya. The one that's approved for use in the U.S. Uh, has uh, uh, topography, uh, which is great for uh, when if you want to fit orthokeratology lenses. Um, it has axial length measurements, so it's a biometer, and uh, that is very important. And we highly recommend that you know every doctor invests in that. Uh, because now myopia is really the, the disease of axial elongation. Uh, there is also pupillometry, which is becoming very important biomarker, especially uh, when looking at the treatment zone in orthokeratology and also in patients who are taking atropine with the um, dilation. So um, those are like the most important uh, tools that we have available, but there are so many other uh, tools that could be used. We are working also on trying to get the uh, growth curves approved for the use in the U.S. Right now, we have them approved uh, everywhere else, like in Canada and in Europe. And we're also looking to include the um, dry eye suite uh, so we can uh, look at these patients, uh, my bombing glands and uh, the dry, dry eye status of these patients, especially that even though they're children, but you know, when you're wearing contact lenses, you have an increased risk of dry eye, also from the pharmaceutical drops from atropine, you could get dryness. So that's also becoming like a, a, a big disease that's kind of connected indirectly to the myopia world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, um, how have you seen, uh, you're on the medical science side, and for the people who, who don't really know what that means is that you, you're not there to sell people, right? You're there to educate them. Sure. How are you seeing this knowledge around myopia, uh, educating and educating around axial length? How, how is that uh, evolved over the last maybe three years or so with people bringing on the Maya and using it in their clinic? How, how are they reaching out and talking to you about that? Uh, well, there is definitely more awareness the last few years. Uh, you know, we we are involved in so many uh, conferences uh, that brings awareness. You know, um, lots of uh, doctors are having the device, so there is like a word of mouth, like where they uh, send the message, like talk to other doctors and and get the device. So. Uh, there has been a lot of awareness. We also have been like very active being involved in a lot of webinars and uh, workshops uh, solely and also in collaborations with other companies. So that has been, you know, making the Maya more popular these days. Yeah. Yeah. So if, um, if, if somebody, you know, decided to come on board and they, they, they bought a device like the Maya, what what kind of recommendations fr from you might you give to them as to how to incorporate it into their practice, right? It's an additional machine. So it's not like a machine where they walk in the door and they get an autorefractor maybe every time they come in. This is something different. Is this something you recommend only on certain age groups? Like how, how would you recommend somebody clinically incorporate um, axial length or the dry eye suite or whatever it is into their practice. What's your guys' recommendation on that? So we recommend that they actually uh, do axial length on every single pediatric patient uh, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times uh, it catches people before they even start the onset of myopia. So anybody who is like, let's say, uh, a half a diopters plus a half diopters at the age of um seven to 10, you know, there is a big chance that they're going to become myopic. Uh, so it's important to track these patients. So it's not only limited to, I don't recommend that the clinicians only limit the use of axial length for myopic patients, but also for hyperopes and emetropes. Because if we start treatment early, you know, we might save that child from dealing with all these complications later in life. Yeah, so, and I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I wanted to add that this is really my job here is uh, to, uh, I'm, I'm a medical science liaison, so I'm liaising between uh, me, like between the company and uh, the clinician, between the company and the researcher 
in order to uh, you know, draw more awareness and help support them uh, to create more clinical and research uh, evidence. And we also have these like uh, axial length and refractive error trend analysis where you can graph uh, each like point by point how the axial length was every like during the duration of the, when the patient comes back to the clinic. So that helps you see how axial length is elongating and how long and uh, like um, at, at what point it's starting to like increase. So we have a yeah. lot of like great tools that uh, you could use even in patients who are non-myopic. Yeah. And, and, you know, these growth curves and these charts are available outside of your machine that people can, can use. So if, if, they incorporate uh, an axial length device into their clinic right now and in their in the United States and those growth curves are not currently on the machine because you said you're working through the FDA, they're available outside the US. They can they can follow those, but seeing those curves that the machine does graph for the patient is is really helpful. I think, you know, absolutely that's one of the best patient education tools that we can yes. have. I do want to touch on one thing and I'm going to push back on you just a little bit is you mentioned the importance of axial length on every pediatric patient. And I couldn't agree with you more about that, except I would say that now in our practice, we're way more seeing the value of adding it to our adult population than I thought we would. And here's the reason why, and I mean, you can speak to this better than I, is that if your axial length is less than 26 millimeters, you've got a 3.8% risk of developing a visual impairment of less than 2040 vision. If you're over 26 millimeters, that shoots to 25% chance of developing a visual impairment in your life. And if it's over 30 millimeters, you've got a 90% risk. Mm -hmm. So I had a patient the other day who was a minus eight and her axial length was 25 right? No, normally I would be like super worried about that patient, but you know, it's, it's higher, but she's not as high of a risk as I thought. And likewise, I might have a minus two who's a 26 and a half millimeter, right? And so it's it, it, because we've always thought about this as a refractive, like high myopes, people with high prescription numbers have those risk factors. Again, it goes to back to what we were talking about earlier is it's the eye elongation disease that we need to be thinking about, not just, and that's why that value of having axial length for all of your patients is so important. We, since bringing in axial length, we were just doing it in pediatrics, but now we've switched over and are using it in everybody. And you didn't say it wrong in the myopia world. It's definitely important to use it on every pediatric patient because we don't know if they're going to become myopic, right? They might be a hyperope right now, but we know that axial length really starts to change a year before they become myopic. And so it's telling us about that information so much. Soon, I hope that we will we will take myopia off the discussion when we talk about axial length because it would it would help us so much more, right? I, I so agree with you. And as yeah. they said, we don't have to limit ourselves to pediatrics, but no, also right. to adults and to people with different refractive errors. So pretty much everyone. <laughs> everyone that benefits. And the cool thing about the Maya, to, to, to that point, is that the Maya, it, um, it, it also allows you to do other screenings, right? So if somebody is, um, is coming in for an eye exam and you're going to do axial length on them, boom, you can do a, a, a topographer on that contact lens patient and see what their topography is looking like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have several cases that I've presented as to how the topography just looked a little funny on some of my patients that I was considering myopia management on. And so we ended up doing some genetic testing on them and found them to be at a high risk of developing keratoconus. It didn't look like keratoconus yet. It just looked funny. And if you, boom, had that screening right up front, right off hand with that patient, you could then determine, you know, in the exam room, hey, this might be somebody for ortho K. This might be somebody better suited for soft multifocal. I should do an additional screening for genetic counseling. 
you know, or maybe this patient goes into atropine and having all of that there. And then in the adult population, maybe you don't need to do topography, but maybe they have the dry eye suite and they can do mybography on those patients. So really, I, I love the fact that it's kind of all included in one device that you can get. I've told so many optometrists over the last couple of years that uh, I don't think you should buy any pieces of equipment that only do one thing, right? Thank Companies you. have the capability of shoving it all into one. And it sounds like, sounds like you've heard the cry of optometrists as we're running out of room, put everything into one. Right. That's such right. a- definitely a well-compacted device, very small. Yeah, footprint. yeah. So- yeah. That is also it, a plus. <laughs> it, it looks kind of like uh, it, it looks kind of like a big auto refractor, right? It's a standalone. It's got a bigger screen, so it's not super cumbersome like an OCT as far no. as a footprint, right? It's very small. All of Topcon devices are pretty small. You know, it's a Japanese company, so they make sure that everything is compacted and all in one. What's the what's the history of Topcon? They're a Japanese company. They've been in eye care forever. Um, are they outside of eye care or is it just eye care? No, they they do have an agriculture section as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a huge company. Um, they started as uh, like a, you know producing uh, or or manufacturing uh, cameras. That's how it started. Right and from there, it went into optics and into uh vision devices so yeah yeah so it's like a long history and we recently actually celebrated our 90th year anniversary wow yep so long history of yeah. uh, optics and clinical devices yeah well some very cool stuff i appreciate you sharing with us a little bit more about your myopia background. I love talking to people who are passionate about it. I love the fact that, you know, you're getting to do something that you've, you know, worked your entire career for with your master's, your OD, your PhD, your clinical work, and now you're applying it, helping doctors to be better and understand their information better. And uh, it's just, it was, it was awesome to get to talk with you. Same here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned next time for additional amazing episodes. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.